me smore the David. I don't know how to blow it hard. Me no teshe yar bitzeni, am e menuchot yanacholeni. Nafshi shovech, yanacheni v'magle tzedek l'ma'an shomo. Gam ki helech v'git san ma'avet Lo irara ki atai ma'adi Shivtecha o mishantecha Hema yanacha muni Taroch lefanai shulchan Neged Tzuri rai Tishanta vashemen roshi Kosi rivaya Ach tov chesed yudifuni Koyam echayay Vishaviti Vivet Adonai Leorech Yamin I've chanted for you the words of our 23rd Psalm. On these days where we are seeking comfort and strength, we often turn to the psalmist. And so I ask you now to recite these words with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember her. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember her. In the opening buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember her. In the blueness of sky and in the warmth of summer, we will remember her. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember her. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember her. And when we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember her. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember her. So long as we live, she too will live. For she is now a part of us, as we remember Ruth M. Rubin. To her children, to Sandy, Barb, Mike, and Jeff, also to Anne, Dave, and Lisa, to her grandchildren, Matt, Michelle, Carrie, Nicole, Nathaniel, and Elias, to her brothers-in-law, Joel and Alan, and her sisters-in-law, Lucille, Audrey, and Jean. And on this day, also, we lovingly remember Ruth's daughter-in-law, Wendy, of blessed memory. To all the members of the family and so many cherished friends, we've gathered together today to remember and also to celebrate the life of your beloved Ruth. Our sages, in their wisdom, have taught us that birth is a beginning and death a destination and life is a journey from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing. 
from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. Ruth Rubin and the story of her life, a life of 90 years. This story is one that can be described simply as a miracle. Ruth's journey began in Hamburg, Germany. She was born in 1925 to Julius and Gertrude Michaelis. Ruth and her older brother Alfred enjoyed a happy childhood. Their parents were involved in the family business as they owned and operated a children's department store. The Michaelis family enjoyed a comfortable life. Ruth would recall having maids and butlers while growing up in Hamburg and her parents owned land where they built a beautiful country estate home. And as Hitler's power grew, life for Ruth and her family began to change drastically. The family lost their business, the department store, and racial laws were in place, and so Jews were no longer allowed to attend public school or ride the trolley. Ruth, Ruth and her parents they were in the minority. Her parents knew that their safety, even their lives, were in grave danger. Where the majority felt safe, there were many who knew it was time to go. And so in 1938, the Michaelis family applied for visas to several different countries, including Australia and Switzerland, parts of Asia and the United States. In 1939, Think about that year, 1939. The visas were approved for Ruth, Alfred, and her, her parents. And so they came to America. They sailed and arrived at Ellis Island. Their stay in New York City was less than a year as they found that Cleveland, Ohio would become their permanent home. The family lived in a home on Lenox Road off of Fairmont Boulevard in Cleveland Heights. Ruth began attending school at Roxboro Junior High School. Her earliest lessons in English were from the school janitor, who would often give Ruth comic books to read and help improve her command of the English language. She went on to attend Cleveland Heights High School, and following her graduation, she continued her education at Mather College, where she studied nursing and biological sciences. One summer, while she was still in her high school years, Ruth was at Cumberland Pool with some of her friends. And one of the young lifeguards there, Saul Rubin, well, I believe Ruth may have wanted to catch his attention because for no reason at all, she pushed him into the pool. <laughs> this flirtatious move definitely got Saul's attention, and so she kept his attention for over 50 years. Sal and Ruth began dating, and he wanted to marry her sooner than later. But Ruth's father insisted that she had to finish college before marrying. And so in 1947, the day after her graduation from Mather College, Ruth and Sal were married. Theirs was a true love affair. As a couple, they were blessed with so many wonderful friends from so many different parts of their lives. Friends from high school, friends from college, their friends from Catawba, and their college friends were known as the Lunch Bunch, 
a group they'd gather with once a month, and also for special occasions like just recently this past New Year's Eve. Together, Ruth and Saul, they traveled. They loved camping. They were involved with their children in many ways, including as the troop leader and scoutmaster of their kids' Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops. And these were all great memories for Sandy, Barb, Mike, and Jeff. And then Ruth and Saul's grandchildren. Oh, they also have their precious memories. Memories of Camp Reuben and the family's summer home in Catawba. There was camping, fishing, swimming, <coughs> and of course those bright yellow t-shirts that blasted out the title Camp Reuben. <coughs> Ruth and Saul enjoyed over, over 54 years of marriage until Saul's passing in 2002, and they were a love match, partners. They lived a good life together. In speaking with Ruth's children, I learned that their mother passed on to them so many great examples, and she demonstrated so many life lessons, lessons that her four children carry with them and have passed on to their children as well. Sandy, <coughs> excuse me, Sandy, you shared with me, you said that she felt very strongly about giving back to the community that took her in. This meant so much to your mom. Sandy, you, sh you said that she instilled in us the importance of giving back to the community and to our families and to each other. You said that your mom had you all volunteering from an early age. And as far as giving back in looking at all four of your careers and your extracurriculars, Sandy, you see that in, in your everyday life, you and your siblings give back to your communities and to your families all the time. Sandy, your mom taught you how to knit when you were about seven or eight years old. And whether your knitting occurred during the most relaxing moments or times, or even those times where you were dealing with great stress, that skill, that gift of knitting that she gave to you, it remains to you still to this day as a very calming activity. <coughs> Sandy, Every time that you give back, every time that you create another sweater, another one of those hats, those caps, your mom is there with you with each good deed and with every stitch. Mike, of course, you and your mom also shared a very special bond. And it seems, Mike, from the stories you shared with me that perhaps you provided your mom with some unique challenges. You admitted that... You had some very interesting eating habits. You were very finicky. And at times, Mike, maybe all the time growing up, you were what we would say all boy, sneaking out of the house at night and even more. But your mom, you said, was always, no matter what was going on, she was always your biggest supporter. Sometimes she didn't agree with your choices, but she was always there for you, a source of support and encouragement and you described that love and that support and that, that encouragement, Mike, you described it always as unconditional. This is how she was for you and for your brother and your sisters. And Barb, you said she was, and I quote you, a remarkable, involved, and modest woman. <coughs> Barb, you said there was so much that your mom just wouldn't take credit for. She loved to do for others but she didn't want to take credit or have acknowledgement about it. Barb, you also shared that she instilled in you and in your siblings that life doesn't just hand you things. She taught you that you need to work for it. Your mom demonstrated to all of you a great work ethic. You said that there was no lying in beds on Saturday mornings, not with her. Your mom said you had to get up and get going. And you also took note that your mom made the most of what life handed her. It's sweet that Ruth's daughters-in-law and her son-in-law also sang her praises. Lisa, maybe the highest compliment you could give to a mother-in-law. <coughs> Lisa, you said that she never meddled 
And this is something that a daughter-in-law might complain about a mother-in-law. But you said she never meddled. You could talk to her about almost anything. She would listen to you intently. And while she might have in her mind the advice she wanted to give you, after you were done telling her the story, the concern, maybe even the complaint, she would say to you her famous line, what do you want me to say? Because she wanted to say what you wanted to hear. And you marveled at Ruth's ability to really support the family, to, to make the family number one. You said that she, she really emphasized the importance of family, but she also had this great fascination with your family, Anne, and everyone else's family. She wanted to know people's history, their roots, their journey. And this was something that you found really special about her. And Dave, you mentioned to me that you're uncertain now about your visits to Cleveland because Ruth was the reason. She was the reason to come back to Cleveland. With her being gone, you described it as a big hole. You remarked on all the things she has done for you, for the, your family, for your extended family, the love that she has shed.